my job as a, as a conservator and a horologist is actually to preserve all these things, right? So these tiny objects are so delicate. These little pieces uh, are about the size of my pinky. This tiny bird has maybe over 30 pieces in it alone. And this little bird is part of a singing bird mechanism. So when I go in to work on something like this, uh, I'm, my first priority is actually making sure that the object uh, stays as true to historic, its historic values or its properties as possible. So for example, if there's a thread in this piece that is stripped, I will not put a new modern thread or a new modern screw in there. I will actually get a screw plate from the era from which this piece was made and uh, remake the screw using historically accurate threads because this was made before screws were standardized. So here is this tiny little mechanism. And there's our little protagonist, our singing bird. And each of these pieces are really different. <laughs> that one I call panic attack. <laughs> He's very quick. They all have these really specific personalities. So basically each one, though, though many of them were produced in a series and produced by the same firm, none of them were really the same. The parts are not interchangeable. So you can't have one and change things from one to the other. And even the song and the way that it's feathered and the way that it behaves is really a reflection of the craftsman that engineered it and made it, made it by hand. This is another one, my favorite. What's making the sound? So inside, um, you actually will see a video that's a little bit larger, which will explain it all to you. But basically, it's a, a bellows and a slide whistle with a plunger that goes in at a, a depth that's programmed, that's predetermined by a cam. So we were actually pretty obsessed with um, reanimating dead things. Right? So um, not only were we using skin on flute fingers, but we were taking real birds that were taxidermied and then stuffing them with clockwork. So what's interesting about this is that we have this beautiful scarlet tanager that is you know, still alive long after all of its family and counterparts have moved on. This is a, a piece that I actually did here. I made this bird from scratch. It's not a stuffed bird. <laughs> Individual feathers have been applied. So there you can see the bellows. They're pumping there on the left. And then you have the slide whistle. And you can see there's a plunger that's moving in and out at a rapid pace. This is all dictated by these toothed wheels, which are called cams. And basically, the cams uh, are telling that, that plunger how far to go inside the whistle bore. And then at the same time, you have a release of a valve. And that's causing the trill of the bird. So that's where you're getting the And then you get the like that. This is an interesting piece that I worked on for uh, the National Trust. This was in, Anglesey, in the Anglesey Abbey National Trust House in the United Kingdom. This actually was from the Forbidden City uh, Museum there in Beijing. This had been owned by one of the emperors. And what's really interesting about this piece, and what's interesting about all of these pieces and these examples that I'm showing you is that each one is quite different, and the ethical considerations that we give to each piece are quite considered. So, this is an interesting example of a fusion between um, basically Chinese engineering and English engineering. So we had this original mechanism being made in London, um, and it was also made by James Cox. So the gentleman that created that sterling swan, as well as that peacock clock, made this clock. Now, this has two mechanisms. It has a simple clock mechanism that's used for telling the time, and then it has a more complicated automaton mechanism with bells and such for playing music and governing the movement of the different figures on this clock. So what happened was when it went to it went to Beijing, when it went to the Forbidden City, the emperor decided that it didn't play fast enough. He didn't want the Western music. So 
what he had his clockmakers do was to actually remove the original springs and put much larger springs in. This made it run much faster. So we ended up having something that didn't quite sound like it did when it left here. And probably what's most fascinating about that particular piece's journey is the fact that the people at Anglesey Abbey that had visited and seen this clock play got so used to hearing it and seeing it play in this modified state that when it came time to do the restoration, they decided they wanted it left as it was. So the National Trust decided to leave it in an altered state, which actually long-term was detrimental for the movement. Um, so we had to do some creative problem solving with that. <laughs> 